All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank y'all for coming. My name's Edison Titus. Uh, today, we're here to talk about uh, real estate investment, development, and syndication and funds. Now, this is a very high, high level overview. Uh, it's just a primer, just to get you uh, started down your path, whatever path that may be, and we'll get into that. Uh, but before that, we're after the presentation, we're gonna be having a Q&A session. That'll be the bulk of the time. So I'm gonna fly through this reasonably quick. I'm not going to bore you. Um, and for the Q&A, of course, I'll be up here, but also we'll have Jason Hyman and Elijah Garcia, but I'll let them talk about their backgrounds and why they're up here as part of this panel. Uh, Jason Hyman, I am an urban planner, uh, the broker owner for the office of Jason T. Hyman. We do uh, brokerage and urban planning services. Um, I kind of cut my teeth in development, working with the city of Houston, doing public and private finance deals. Um, you fast forward to today, um, aside from our office where we practice and pretty much support developers, investors, builders, things of that nature. Um, I also founded a uh, nonprofit development company. Um, you guys may see as a Do the Things That Matter campaign where we pretty much connect and partner with developers to help them get going. So. Hope I can answer any questions you have. Uh, I'm Eli, Eli Garcia. Uh, I am in the construction from uh, commercial property management side. And we have for commercial properties, and that's how I tapped into the home game. Um, I do work for Perry Homes, DR Horton. Um, and uh, we are here to, I guess, uh, share a little bit about what the real estate side is and um, how my side connects with, with Titus's. Uh, platform uh, basically um, from new home every every square foot is different every plot of land is different um, price per square foot is to the good stuff all right so who is the Titus law firm real quick we are a a firm of about we're now at about 13 people um, we're actually looking for a couple of employees, but um, we have everything under one roof that you would need. We have business, real estate, estate planning, probate, um, tax, and SEC work. When I say SEC, I mean safe harbor rules, 506, uh, 504, things that don't mean much to you right now, but we'll get to that in a moment. We also have an in-house accountant. What does this mean for you? This means that you have a one-stop shop for everything that you need regarding business, money, real estate, um, including civil litigation in the areas of business and real estate. I can go into great detail about what that means for you, but there are very few places that you can get the legal expertise you need and the financial help and the tax matter help that you need under one roof that know all of your concerns that you've got going on. All right, so real estate investment. We talked uh, briefly about investment, development, and syndication and funds. I divide these up because investment means, for our purposes, you're putting your money in. You're putting your money in and you want to return. That can look several different ways. The first question is, how are you secured? You want to invest. You want to make sure that you are secured and you do not lose your money. And if you are in a tight spot, you wanna make sure that you can have recourse. So the best way to explain this is a mortgage. You go to Wells Fargo or Chase, you're buying a house and you get a mortgage. What is a mortgage? Everyone has a vague idea of what a mortgage is. But in reality, what's, what's going on, there's three main documents that make up a mortgage. There's a deed that says that you own it with a vendor's lien that says that Wells Fargo or Chase has a claim on your property. There is a promissory note. That means that you have a promise to pay principal plus interest over a certain number of years. And if you don't pay it, they can come after you. And then there's a deed of trust. A deed of trust is you giving Wells Fargo or Chase the legal right to take your property if you do not pay. 
the three of those things working together are a mortgage, right? Why does that matter for you as an investor? Because you want to secure your investment. If John Doe comes to you and says, hey, put $100,000 into my project, you don't want to just sign a contract and then hand over a check. Because if something goes wrong, yes, you have some protection with that contract, but now you have to go hire an attorney, pay his retainer, get the other side served, hope that you win, and then you've got to figure out how to execute that judgment. This is a whole lot of time and a whole lot of money. Whereas if you make sure you're secured on the front end, you're just like Wells Fargo or Chase. You have the unilateral right, you have a certain level of priority to go after that property and or that individual because of course you want a personal guarantee, right? So what happens if they file bankruptcy? Well, I'm glad you asked. If they file bankruptcy, um, sure, you have to go through the bankruptcy process as a creditor, but now you have a certain level of priority. If you're unsecured debt, fat chance that you're gonna receive anything. But if you are secured by real estate, well then what happens is you are pretty high up on the list for at least getting a good portion of your money back. So the name of the game is security. Now what do you ask for? Do you ask for debt, equity, both? What, what, what do you ask for? You know what, this is actually just the framework so I'm gonna keep on going because I'm going through each one of these. All right, so like I said, a contract is never enough. Insist that, you know, insist that it's not enough. If they tell you it is enough, run, right? Everything I just now said about personal guarantees and such, it still stands, mortgage, all that good stuff. So when you think like a, ba uh, a bank or an asset bank lender, what you wanna do is you wanna ask for personal guarantees. You wanna figure out if this company that you're investing in has any assets or if it's solely for uh, investment purposes. You wanna look at individual assets. It might be that John Doe is asking you for $75,000 or $100,000 for his company, XYZ LLC. But if that company doesn't have any assets and he's underneath that company, he's behind that company, he has liability protection. So of course you want a personal guarantee so you can go after his house, go after his Porsche, go after his collection of Rolexes, right? And then project assets. What that means is if that entity is for the purposes of just a real estate project, well then that real estate project itself that is owned by that, that company that was made for this purpose, you want to have a lien on that specific property, that project asset, right? Now, what are you getting in return? There's a lot of things you can ask for, but it boils down to debt and equity. Equity is simply, you know, if the project does well, I do well. You share in the profits. Debt means no matter how well the project does or how badly it does, you get what you're supposed to get. So quick illustration, if you put in 25% of the money and you bargain for 25% parity, there are $100,000 in profits, well then you get 25% of the money. But if you put in some certain amount of money and you're getting a flat percentage rate, let's say 10% for some period of time per annum, well then that's all you get. No matter how, they could make it $100 million, all you get is that that you bargain for as debt because you're holding the note. They owe you money. Now, if the project fails, they still owe you the money, especially if you have a personal guarantee, right? So some people, they'll even, you know, get, they'll, they'll hedge their bets and they'll say, you know what? I'm going to put some money in for equity so I can take up on the upside and I'm going to put some money in in debt. So no matter what, I know that I'm getting the return that I'm supposed to get and I have recourse. Um, then we get down to convertible notes. Now that's a little uh, fancy. Don't try and do this by yourself. Uh, that's when you have a piece of debt that you can convert to equity. I'm actually gonna stop there because it can get pretty, uh, pretty tricky. So I don't, I probably should never included that one on there, but it's debt that has the right but not the obligation to convert to equity. And the reason why you might do this is because if you see that the project is going poorly, you keep it as debt. They're gonna owe you regardless. If you see that the project is doing well, then you convert it to equity. Does that make sense? 
All right, we got some nodding heads. All right, so um, structure considerations. Who's doing the project? So you hear, you'll hear terms like a sponsor, a developer, but those don't have any like concrete definitions. You could be a sponsor because you found the project or maybe you own the land, but then you get a team or an individual developers for hire and you're like, hey, I want you to do it and I'm just gonna kick back. So in that case, I'm the sponsor, they're the developer, right? It could be that I have a hand in it and maybe as a group we're developers, but I'm handling one piece, he's handling the next and so on. So the, what I'm trying to get across to you is you want to know who is doing the project because if you're gonna give your hard earned dollars as an investment, you wanna know who they are, where they come from and what they ate last Tuesday, right? Who's the GC? Who's building it? Is this some random guy who said, yeah, I've swung a hammer before? You wanna know something about this GC. Who's the construction project manager? Well, what's that? Uh, if we have a GC, what do we need a construction or project manager for? Well, the reason we, why is because sometimes you need someone who's on your side, so to speak, who's kind of overseeing what's going on and they know the ins and outs. They know what's going on with permits. They know how much material should cost. They know when the GC is trying to blow smoke up your rear end. Um, who's the numbers guy? Who's the guy who's good with numbers, who can figure out a spreadsheet, a pro forma, all that good stuff, who can tell you what your projected profits are? If you're going into something because someone said something that sounded good, they made you feel good, they bought you a couple of drinks, it's probably not the best way to go. You wanna be able to crunch those numbers or hire someone who can crunch those numbers for you. You need to be able to appropriately project what's going on and why it's gonna go that way. Choice of entity. There's a lot of different entity choices. At the end of the day, you want liability protection for yourself. And of course, the entity or the investment is going to want um, liability protection. I won't lean into that too much, but you wanna be aware of what it is because when you talk to your legal counsel, there might be ramifications for that. Um, roles in the entity, general partner, shareholder, member, manager, these things matter. A lot of folks, they might have filed an LLC for themselves, but who is the member, who is the manager, um, uh, who is the general partner, these things matter because if things go left, who has the power to do what based off of the organization documents and who has more liability in the case of a suit all of these things matter. You wanna make sure that those things are understood. Roles and control in the project. Again, for the same matter within, you need to know who is responsible for what. The, 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 the GC or the construction manager isn't responsible for the money. And the, the construction is not under the purview of the guy with the numbers. So you need to know who's doing what and why they're doing it. Um, as a last consideration, as uh, someone who is investing, you want to demand thoughtfulness and thoroughness. Does the person who's asking you for money, do they have a reasonably detailed pro forma? Does it have to be something that's like what you'd get from Blackwater or KKR or something like that? Oh, I'm sorry, BlackRock. No, it doesn't have to be that, but they have to be able to defend whatever their numbers are. They have to be able to explain it to you. You don't have to be the expert, but you damn well sure better be able to understand it after they explain it to you. Do they have an investor return profile? Well, Titus, what is an investor return profile? That means what is it that you're supposed to be getting? What's your IRR? What's your ROI? What's it supposed to look like and why are you supposed to get that sort of return? Do they have skin in the game? Now that's not 100% necessary. They could have little to no skin in the game, but it's usually a good watermark. If they've put, you know, if, if, if this is a $500,000 deal and they've put $100,000, 20% of their own money into it, you can probably sleep a little bit better at night. Whereas if they have zero money in it at all, then less so. An investment you can understand generally and specifically. What this means is, you know, as a general idea, if someone came to you and said, hey, I want you to put money into a, a biomedical ribosomes, I have no clue what that means, I, none at all. 
would I invest in something in biomedical mechanics or whatnot? Probably not. I just don't have any sort of a general understanding in it, right? Specifically, meaning that specific project. So what's something that I do know? I do know real estate and I know it pretty well. But if someone came to me and they said, hey, I have this real estate project. It's, a, it's right there at the port of Houston and it's an industrial complex that deals with, uh, you know, the offloading and onloading of chemicals onto ships and, and trains. Well, I know real estate, but I don't really know that specific project. I don't know the ins and outs of that sort of a thing. Could I possibly get away with doing it? Maybe, but there's so many other things to put your money into. Why go into something that you don't understand? Now, that doesn't mean that you can't take the time to learn about something generally or specifically, but that's up to you if you wanna take the time to get to that point. Credentials and or experience. I say and or because there's a lot of folks out here, very sharp, very trustworthy, but they don't necessarily have credentials out the wazoo but they gotta have credentials and or experience. They have to know what they're talking about. Um, does the investee get annoyed by your asking questions or consulting with your advisors? If the answer is yes, run. If they start to get a little, little pompous, well, why are you asking this, you should just trust me or whatever the case may be, don't even waste your time, leave. Real estate development, a framework. Development, what do I mean by development? The process of selecting a project, doing the project, and exiting from the project, right? You'll see these numbers, what does that mean? This is the first thing you have to do. You have to select a site for acquisition. At the same time, you might be doing the numbers, and while you're doing the numbers, you might also be doing planning and raising, if you're doing raising and acquiring debt. So these numbers illustrate the fact that there's a lot of overlap or possibility for overlap. But this is the general order of how things go. Site acquisition, uh, selection and acquisition. So this is, when you get to Q&A, a lot of these questions will be directed to Jason, right? Local rules and ordinance what can you do with parking at this spot, but you can't do it at another spot? Setbacks, occupancy, there, there's a long list of things that he could probably talk about better than I, right? Pre-contract and cost analysis. In light of what you wanna do, hey, I wanna do a quadplex, I wanna do an eightplex, I wanna do a single family home, a stack duplex, right? What is it that you wanna do? And can you do it on that site? Does it make monetary sense to do it on that site? Contracting and the purchase and sale agreement. Your due diligence, your contract period. How do you negotiate that? What's reasonable, what's feasible, right? The numbers, usually done during due diligence. You want a whole project pro forma. And remember, we're talking about development not through the eyes of an investor, we're talking about development through the eyes of what you must do if you want to do the development, right? You want a pro forma because now you're the person who may or may not be asking others for money, but even if it's your own money, you want to be able to project what's going to happen and why, all the way down to the number of nails or hinges on the door. The more detail, the better, including investor return profile. Again, if you're gonna have investors, you want to be able to tell them, hey, this is what I think that you're gonna be able to make and here's why. Your title report, survey, environmental, all of these things are germane to you understanding whether or not during the due diligence period you're going to move forward. Maybe a lot of things match, but maybe you have to build the property up too much, put a whole lot more dirt because it's in a flood zone and it makes things more expensive or um, you know, the cost of insurance would be onerous or something of the sort. Um, now keep in mind, disposal. Now that's at the end, but you want to keep the disposal in mind because that's going to tell you what you can and cannot do at the very beginning of the project. Are you looking to hold on to it? Are you doing a cash out refinance? Are you holding it long term? Are you going to do a 1031 exchange or into a Delaware statutory trust? What the hell does that even mean? 
why not a Wyoming statutory trust? That's a little bit of legal humor. Um, oh, you could even roll it into a fund or a REIT, a real estate investment trust. All right, planning. So architecture, design, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, permits, these are questions that you could um, give to Jason and Elijah. When you plan this project out, like the actual planning, you've decided to do it, but now you've got to get your design together, get your architecture, you gotta put in your plans to the city or the county or whomever, get the thumbs up, uh, start to break ground, all those sorts of things. You've got to plan this out. That is, just a part of it. I'm sure you'll have questions about this. Talk to those guys. Um, now I'm gonna skip this because we're gonna get to raising in the next module, um, but if you are a developer, you might end up raising money. You want to raise money? You know what, that's a question. Why do you wanna raise money? But we'll, we'll get to that. Um, okay, so acquire debt. So you need to get a conditional approval, right? If the bank's going to give you money, they need to know who you are, what you're doing, and what type of money is to be made. They need to feel safe in you and the project. And if you say, hey, this is a million dollar project and I need X amount of money, they're gonna come back and say, look, our risk tolerance is that we're gonna give you X amount, but you gotta show us that you have Y amount of cash. Now, if you're big bank Hank, and you've got all the cash in the world, well then you are just fine. You've got the cash in your pocket, you can get the debt. But if you don't have that much cash or you wanna spread the risk and give a chance for other people to make some money with you, then you wanna raise the money. So you need the bank to tell you, hey, we'll give you half a million, but you gotta come up with another half a million. So maybe you put in 100,000 yourself and then you go to your friends, your family, whomever, and you raise another 400,000. So they got to understand the project, bless you and your team, bless the legal structure, bless the numbers in the project, state the amount of equity that's needed for them to commit to the debt. And of course, you want to get that commitment on paper, right? By the way, this should also tell you that if you're going to invest in something and someone says, hey, um, I want to, you know, I want an investment from you of $100,000, you should also have the, the wherewithal to say, well, where are you with your financing? How much do you need to raise and what bank is gonna give you how much if you've raised X amount of money? Um, construction. So these are Elijah questions, right? Your permits, actual construction, inspections. And then there's a, a list of other things that we could get into that cross into my territory and Elijah's territory. But when you contract with the GC, I know, I, I know you've heard that all general contractors are honest and they would never mess you over. But in my profession, there are some, you know, you know. So how do you contract with them? Do you ask for bids? How does that work? What kind of compensation? Are they going to get a percentage? Are they gonna get a flat amount? Are they gonna get some sort of a hybrid? Um, documentation for change orders and things of that nature. like. You want everything documented. And you also want to know if, you know, they bought a piece of plywood for $15, but they're telling you it costs $48. Um, relationship between the owner, the developer, the GC, and the subcontractors. Why does this matter? Because in Texas, liens are a thing. If you're the developer, you want to avoid liens being placed on your property, on your project, right? but it's a necessary tool for the contractors, the subcontractors and so on and so forth, because if you are a Donald Trump and you don't wanna pay your GC, well then they're up the creek, right? So they have to file a lien. So the way that you get around this is you have a contract that states a voluntary lien and also that as payments are made, they're giving um, uh, lien releases. So if they're, if they're supposed to get paid X amount of money through invoices or a flat amount or whatever the case may be, as they're supposed to be paid and you pay them, they give you a lien waiver or a lien release. And then you file that into the property record. So there's a going proof of what was paid to whom. I can get into a lot of detail about that because it also goes down to the subcontractors underneath the GC. But the idea here is there is a way 
through contracting and your um your your liens and your lien releases to have everything appropriately papered up. Uh, tranches. So all that is is when you get your your lending squared away, the bank is not going to say, "Oh, we said we're going to give you half a million. Here's all half a million right now." They're going to give it to you in tranches. Disposal. So disposal should have already been figured out at the very beginning, right? You want to figure out your disposal at the beginning because that's going to dictate what you're doing at the beginning. There's various things you can do. You can do a cash out refinance. That means that the value of your property is now at a million dollars, but the project cost was half a million, right? So now there's a whole half a million dollars in equity in your property. So cash out refinance might say that, hey, you can do 90% or 80% or some percentage of the equity that's outstanding and you could pull that cash out. Now, because it's debt, that's not money that will be taxed because if you take that money out, it's debt, you're gonna have to repay that through the proceeds assuming that there are proceeds on that property. Why does that matter? Because if you can get the benefit of money but not have to pay taxes on it, that's pretty nice. And if the property is cash flowing and you're using that money to go back and pay the, um, pay the debt, well then you're just fine. As that property, as that project makes money, which is income that should be taxed, it then has to pay the debt. Wait a minute, does that mean that we get around taxes completely? No, but you defer taxes. Um, our tax attorney isn't here tonight or else you know, she would probably have something to say. Um, so hold, well, everyone knows what a hold is and everyone knows what a sell is, so I'll uh, skip that. A 1031 exchange is a mechanism, a tax mechanism that allows you to uh, sell a property and then with a certain period of time, the proceeds that you've made, you put it right back into another property. That allows you to defer the taxes till later. If you think about it, why does that matter? Because if you make $100,000 in gain and now you have to pay, let's call it 30% in taxes, you would pay that 30% in taxes, you have 70 left over to reinvest. But with the 1031, you get that 100,000, you don't have to pay the tax man because you're deferring taxes, you now have $100,000 to put into that next property. It allows your, you, you to make more money on your money more quickly. And then if you've done appropriate estate planning and asset protection when you're old and gray and you decide you're gonna liquidate some stuff, well, you're gonna make sure that you're poor on paper so you are getting taxed lower. Ah, that's a good one, huh? Um, a Delaware statutory trust is kind of fancy. It's essentially the same thing. The only difference is you don't have to be the direct owner. You could have a manager and you can flip that money into equity in another project. It's not truly equity. It's actually a trust, but we could talk about that later. Um, or you could roll it into a fund or a real estate investment trust, which we're about to get to in a moment. So syndication and funds, a framework. What is a syndication? What's a fund? Let's uh, jump right in. So th these things matter because I see a lot of gurus out there on Facebook and TikTok and, you know, uh, what's the other one? Instagram, YouTube, so on, talking about how to do this, that, and the other in real estate, how to raise money, how to do a, you know, just a whole lot of hogwash. You don't need to spend $40,000 on some sort of a real estate course and you don't need to you know click here and well, wait a minute you clicked on mine you don't need to uh pay money to to show up somewhere the information is out there now i guarantee you those guys some of the information is good but they're weaving it in with bs because they're trying to sell you something or they want you to invest in something and they're giving you subpar returns because most of them i would say kind of subpar returns so um, a syndication, organization or combining of investor pooling capital for investment in an asset class. Um, let, me, let me skip this, this language. What, what you wanna be worried about when you're looking at a fund or a syndication, a syndication means that I know you, you know me. It's an arm's length deal, right? Whereas a fund, you're raising for a fund and the people that you're raising from, you don't necessarily know them. That's not an arm's length transaction. I'm sorry, I, I always, 
it is arm's length when that means that you can reach out and touch them, you know them. She's arm's length. That, that's, that's for syndication. Not arm's length means I can't reach you. I don't really know you like that, right? And, but yet I'm asking you for money. So the SEC, the states, the federal government, they're very, very serious about protecting those individuals um, who don't know you, who you don't know, they don't know you, right? They want to make sure that you're not getting scammed. So that's where the SEC steps in and says that there's these requirements that you must follow when you are going out there asking other people for money, especially if you're soliciting and or they don't know you, right? So with a syndication, you can get around a lot of those rules. The reason being is because it is not an arm's length transaction. They're right there with you, right? The other thing that this implies is that they have some level of control. If you buy a stock in Apple, you own a piece of the company, but you can't walk in through their front doors. You can't go talk to the CEO and say, hey, I have some ideas. You can't do a damn thing, right? You just own a piece of the company because the rules that they've made in that company state what you can and cannot do and what your, what your abilities are by owning that stock. You have a security. A syndication means that you've got some level of control. You've got some level of say-so. You're in this. You can come knock on that that somebody's door and you can say, well, here's what I think or here's what I want to do. You can bargain for some level of power before you put your money in, right? A fund or when you, you know someone is investing in you and it's a security, they have no say-so except for the say-so that you've given them. They've got to essentially shut up in color. Um, that didn't sound good, did it? That, that means that you've got to make sure that if you're raising money, you're giving them something that's palatable and that they feel comfortable in when you to be able to shut up in color. Because you all feel fine when you buy some Apple stock or whatever from NASDAQ, you're just fine having no power. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, it's just that you gotta be comfortable in who you're shutting up and coloring with. All right, so why should you care? We went over this real quick. The sale of unregistered securities is highly prohibited at the state and federal level, with a few exceptions. You know I'm serious because this is in red, all right? This really matters because there's a lot of people out here who are signing these contracts for money, which is essentially security. Hey, give me $100,000, wait a little while, you have no say-so in anything, I'm gonna give you back 150,000. That's a security. Don't do it. It's probably not, they can mean well, but it's probably not going to end well. Control versus no control. That determines everything we just talked about. That's what determines if something's a security or not. You have a security if you have no control. If you have control, it's not a security. I am oversimplifying, but remember, this is a bird's eye view, right? Because I did say with a few exceptions. All right. Um, so syndications and funds, they're all controlled by the type of entity. The type of entity will have certain governing documents, bylaws, operating agreements, limited partnership agreements, so on and so forth. Now funds, all of these things matter and the rules that the SEC puts out there. So they have the Reg A, Tier 1 and Tier 2. These are what they call safe harbor rules, um, 506B and C and 504 crowdfunding and real estate investment trusts, which is actually a, an IRS designation. They're, they're taxed differently and there are certain rules that the IRS com, um, imposes. So technically speaking, you can have a REIT that is on top of a Reg A, a REIT that is on top of a 506B and so on and so forth. So again, when you have a syndication, and again, we're looking at this from the eyes of you find people setting up your own syndication or fund, who's doing what, right? Who's the numbers guy? Who's the construction guy? Or are you even doing construction or just hiring somebody on the outside, in which case you need a construction manager on the inside who can talk their lingo so you don't get fleeced, thereby fleecing your investors, thereby ending you up in court. That's not fun except for me. I, I like that. Who are the rights? Who gets to do what and why? Who are their responsibilities? Who must do what? If you're a part of this, you, you've got responsibilities. And if you're not doing that, then you have a breach of contract. 
how much do you need to raise for a specific project or a set of projects? When you're doing a syndication or a fund, scope matters. Are you buying one particular property, doing one particular project? Are you getting 10 properties, some of which haven't been identified yet? Or are you selling people on a thesis? You have an idea of what will do well, and then you're raising money off of that and then going to go find the projects. That's what you would call a blind fund with a specific strategy. When do you need the equity buy? There's usually a very tight window of when you can raise, unless you have some sort of an evergreen fund. Um, you have to acquire the debt and execute the strategy. All of these things usually have to happen in a tight frame. Well, how do I figure that out? Well, that's where you find people like us. There's a lot of things that I flew by and on purpose because as you can see, any one of these topics, I could probably talk about three hours on it. Um, and I don't think we have enough liquor for that. So raising funds, how do you raise funds? Investor relations, that's highly important. Think about it, if you write a $50,000 check to me, we gotta have some sort of relation. And if when you call me, I hit the go to voicemail button, y'all might not be very happy. Investor relations matter. Fund management. Who's going to manage the numbers, the money? Who, who's going to manage it? Red tape. Governing documents, the private placement memorandum or offering circular SEC disclosures. That's me. Pro formas and the returning pro, return profiles. Again, this guy. Your investment thesis, that would be all of us, right? There's, there's a lot to think about when you are at the point where you now want to raise money to do a project. And the concept of leverage is great. There's nothing wrong with this. People do it all day, every day. This building probably was done with a, um, a fund or a syndication, right? Any shopping center you drive by, especially the fancy ones, probably done that way. The gallery or mall, done that way. Any prime piece of real estate, done that way. You see a luxury high, high rise, done that way. All right, so this is our contact information. Um, excuse that right there. And now we can jump into question and answer because I'm sure that y'all have a lot of great questions. Y'all so, online as well. Please, so, uh, please do type out your questions if you've got uh, questions. So real quick, as a uh, housekeeping, we do have two mics in the back. So my colleague Erin, she, if she raised her hand real quick, she has a second one. So that way uh, you can ask a question. Now, I see a lot of dry cups, so we have a lot of liquor here. So make sure to get you a drink. Has everybody want had a drink ticket, need a drink ticket? Everybody good? All right. Stuff crowd. All right. Oh, you got one? All right, cool. So, again, um, one question I always like to ask uh, very quickly, though. Two people in the room cannot answer this question because they're very aware of what it may do. How much does it cost to hire a lawyer and ask questions? Take a wild guess. Anybody? I got 500. Anybody else? Any rate. One dollar. Uh, a little low. <laughs> there you go. That's another way to put it. Either way, you got 45 minutes to ask all of your questions for free. So with that being said, who has the first question? <laughs> Kick it off. So who's got the first question? You got the first question? All right, here we go. Starting in the front. Um, I'll do two easy ones. Um, the first, what is the standard for hiring a GC? Um, they always want something up front. Sometimes you don't know them. There's no trust, really. And if you're getting a draw from a hard money lender or from someone else where you don't necessarily have all of your construction budget like right there but they want to get paid something and they haven't done anything what's the industry standard industry standard um that would actually pipeline through titus as far as putting all the ducks in place to vet the proper gc to come with you is is he asking for the upfront to start the project 
or is he going to come out with, I don't know, 40 percent of your projects, depending on your budget? Are you have you uh, visited your resources for private money financing or whatnot? So it'll still even come back through a, an attorney or a lawyer, which you kind of already uh, established a relationship. And he would resource into, for example, myself, uh, where we have worked in projects already. And he knows, OK, this guy is, um, you know has established a, a relationship with me as well. Cause you, I, I still see it as well. Um, with general contracts asking for the entire project and then they, they disappear for months or, you know, timelines that I met or whatnot. So going back to what you said, definitely stop establishing the relationship, um, in writing a contract is not enough. Um, develop a pipeline of agreements with an attorney to hold the GC accountable. Definitely is, is the right way or else, you know, you're going to be on the other side of the, of the, of the tail. But um, yeah, that's that's a legal, a legal tie in into the GC is crucial, not just what, you know, oh, here's the money. There's an agreement. OK, I build your home for X, Y, Z, 25,000 or if you, if you uh, establish a, a square foot rate or whatnot. Definitely the pipeline still comes through uh, a legal pipeline. <laughs> Is no standard. That's up to you and that contractor. Whatever y'all figure out, put it in writing. So when he talks about the relationship, that's what's important there. Because the one thing that you said is you said, I don't know them. They don't know you either. Okay? So you may start here, and over time, y'all built that trust to where they're okay because they know you're good for the money. But up front, when you're starting, you might have to set a couple bucks aside and know that that may be part of the negotiation um, in what you're doing. I'll add to that a little bit. If you think about it from the GC's point of view, if you're asking them to mobilize, that means that money's coming out of their pocket, right? Um, that's not an unreasonable ask but that's generally something that's saved for people who they have a relationship with, right? So again, like they both said, you have to paper it up a certain way, you have to negotiate it. Generally, I would say that if you're gonna have to come out of pocket for them to mobilize, because y'all are getting to know one another, then make sure that you just have a tight rein on it. Say, okay, this is a $100,000 project. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna treat you like I'm the bank and I'm gonna give you just enough for you to get started and get to yay point. And that way I can see what's happening because things happen, right? See what variance there is. I gave you 5,000 or 10,000. We said it was going to take us this far. And you're like, oh, something went le way left field. It's $2,000 extra. Okay. Oh, something way went lay way left field and it's $25,000 extra. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold it. So it's not a perfect answer, but that's the that's always the tension between the GC and the owner, the person who's hiring them. Yeah. Well, earlier, um, I know you were talking about how buying a, into a syndication or running a syndication is different than like buying an, an Apple stock um, in that you have some say in it. So I was just wondering, like, what kind of governing um, documents are you dealing with in a syndication? Is there voting rights or what kind of? How is that organized? Is there someone who just makes the decisions and the other people get to have their say or voting structure or something like that? Good question. Um, this is an answer that none of you will like. There is no answer to that. You can do absolutely anything. Anything that's legal under the laws of the state of Texas when you are putting together a um, uh, governing documents for a company, in this case, a syndication, um, you can do it as long as it's legal. Now, there are some like, you know, standard practices, but as you can imagine, if you're doing a, a syndication for starting up a medical practice or a private equity firm or a equity hedge fund, it's different than if you're doing a real estate syndication, right? So industry to industry and person to person or persons to persons, when they're negotiating something, it could look wildly different as far as uh, what layers of governance that there are and what sort of pomp and circumstance they have to go through beyond what the state of Texas requires. So if you name it, it probably can be done. Now, of course, your attorney 
will advise you on some things that are redundant or unnecessary or it makes no sense. But at the end of the day, you would be the individual or the individuals who are putting it together would be the individuals who make up the rules. Y'all make up the rules, the investors have to abide by it, right? And if a big enough investor comes along, they can probably twist your arm. So if you and your partners say, hey, we're gonna put something together and we're gonna put in $200,000 on this $1 million deal, this syndication, and you've got to raise, let's say another 500,000, and you get one investor who comes along and says, I'll put 400,000, he can probably twist your arm into agreeing to certain things that you didn't think about agreeing to beforehand. Cause now you got one investor who's dropping 80% of the money that you need. So did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, all right. All right, do we have another question? So there are a lot of ways to make money. I'm in the healthcare industry, um, looking at getting into real estate. But give me some some reasons why uh, parking my money in real estate might be better than parking it somewhere else for it to work for me. Okay, so these these are going to be subjective answers that I'm giving. That things that I think. Um, the first is that everyone understands real estate at a, at a real intrinsic guttural level, right? It's uh, what you walk on, it's where you sit down to eat, it's where you lay your head. Uh, we all understand the concept of rent. I have access, I'm paying for it, right? And the person who owns it, they're the ones who are getting the money, right? So if you look at other things that you can invest in, there's a lot. There's medical, in all its various forms. There's research and development, there's tech, there's crypto, there's all these sorts of things. But this goes back to what I was talking about earlier. What do you understand? What do you really understand? The other thing is that no one here has a problem investing in a business called Apple because Apple is in your pocket right now. You probably paid $1,000 for that thing, right? And you probably play Apple Music $9.99 a month. You might have Apple TV as well and pay them another 15 bucks a month. So it's, it's more, it's tangible to you, right? Apple, that is. If I start a company, I say, hey, invest in Orange. It's going to be a competitor to Apple and we're going to undercut all their prices. The phones, instead of 1000 or 900 we're going to have Orange music and it's going to be 599 Everything's exactly the same. It's just a little less money. Are you going to give me your money? Is anybody here going to give me your money? I got one believer. All right. Oh, we got two. But companies are just a concept until they're actually moving, right? It's harder for us to grasp with it, right? And those who do, VCs and people who regularly do that, they're not, you know, they have a strategy and they're not blindly going into it. When I say that they're technical, they are highly technical. But in real estate, it's a little bit different because at the end of the day, there is always something there. You can go, you can look at it, you can touch it, right? And you can secure it, right? You can have some level of security in that real estate. So that's why that my opinion is that, you know, do y'all have a different opinion on that? Oh, yeah. So mine is, mine isn't as technical. Mine is probably a little bit more to Texas and just what's going on in the country right now. We got way more demand than we have rooftops right now, period. And it's gonna be that way for the foreseeable future, right? And so I think we're short a couple million rooftops across the country, right? And you think about Texas or Houston in general, I think there's a couple hundred thousand people move here annually now. So I think about 2030 sometime like that, we're supposed to have another million people here. Where are they gonna stay? So it's simple economics for me. It's supply and demand. So we got some folks in here building. They probably can tell you how long is stuff sitting. You got the right product, it's gone before you even probably put the first stick in the ground. So that's that's you know my my uh, perspective. 
I had to Titus and, and Jason's comment. Um, it's a tangible asset. Uh, land has not depreciated. It has, for example, um, an acre earlier during pandemic, prior to the pandemic, you could buy an acre in the outer skirts of Houston in the 16s to 20s. Now those acres are already six figures post pandemic. So, and it's, it, it's, it hasn't gone down. So it's not depreciating. So I, I'm seeing it all uh, around just the Houston skirts. And if you tap into inside the loop and whatnot, that's even astronomical. So I'm just talking about the expansion that Houston's seeing or, or Texas is seeing. Uh, the land is not depreciating. It's tangible. Um, yeah. I'd also like to throw out an interesting statistic. In 2019, Harris County was short about 66,000 HUD homes, Section 8 homes, right? In 2019, 66,000 doors short in Harris County. Just an interesting statistic I wanted to throw out there. All right, so I know we got questions. I got a question real quick. And so for uh, a lot of people that may or may not know this, in the state of Texas, uh, you're not required to have a general contracting license. So if you're building a home, what is the process of identifying the right contractor that is licensed and bonded? And the second part to that question is, is how do you go after a bond versus just someone having general liability insurance? So in the state of Texas, you heard it or you didn't hear it? Oh, so in the state of Texas, you're not required to have a general contracting license, right? So how do you go about identifying an individual who is licensed and bonded? And in essence of that, how do you go after the bond of a in contractor that is bonded versus just their general liability insurance? So that's public information. You can Google it. You can look it up. I forget the agency, the state agency name where you can find that out. But it's uh, not the hardest to find out who's licensed and who's not. And of course, what their, um, who their bond company is, right? Uh, now, but l let me dig a little into that. Insurance, right? So there's different types of insurance, right? There's umbrella insurance, there's general liability, then there's, you know, like project specific insurance, right? Um, Something going wrong and going after insurance is different than something going wrong and going after their bond. Because a bond is not insurance. If the bond is a $100,000 bond, let's say, then that's the max that you can get by going after that bond. And it also depends on if it's a bond for uh, um, like a company bond or if it's a project level bond, like for that specific project. I mean, the process is as simple as finding out who, who they're bonded by. And if you have to sue them, um, the company level bond should be public, uh, public information. Anything else might probably won't be. But if you find yourself in the unsavory position of having to sue, when you do your discovery, that's, that's the first thing that you're going to ask. You're going to ask about insurance. You're going to ask about their bond. What law firm would I contact to do that? Uh, what law firm? Yes. So this is really good when Jones Day and um, <laughs> the Titus Law Firm, that's the one. What is the best practice to find or um, identify pending deals that are looking for additional uh, investors under a syndication? So syndications by, uh, by law, they can't advertise. Um, but funds, some funds can advertise. In general, when you're looking for a place to put your cash, um, sure, there's probably some mailing lists that you can join, but the good ones are always word of mouth. You've got to find the right people to connect with, shake hands, come to stuff like this, get to know other people. Because um, what's your name? Megan? You meet Megan, and one day something comes across Megan's desk, and y'all happen to be talking and she remembers that you are also interested in multifamily and Rocher in Texas. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs>
And then, you know, now you've got an in, right? Maybe it's through your attorney. Maybe it's through someone like these guys. Maybe it's your accountant, your CPA. It's, it's just a word of mouth thing. Um, there are marketplaces, but generally I find that those marketplaces that you find or portals that you find online that are raising money, they usually fee you to death and their, their returns are not as robust as if you find something that is, uh, you know, more organic, if you will. So there's no legal way to solicit um, under a syndication for additional investors is what you're saying. Under a syndication, no, because remember, that means that these are people that you know, right? Like, technically, if I wanted to push the envelope, oh. It, it doesn't mean that you that, necessarily that you know them. You can touch them, right? Is that so they can be at arm's length? Doesn't mean that you know them. So that's a gray area, right? right? It's, a, it's a gray area. I can make an argument, a very good argument for you know, some of you folks who I never met doing a syndication with you because now you're here. I've met you. Mm -hmm. You've spoken to me. I've spoken to you. Um, and what is the prerequisite for going into business with somebody? There is none, right? right? And with the syndication, you're essentially going into business with someone. But can I take out a Facebook ad and say, hey, I'm doing the syndication. I'm looking for business partners. Uh, that, that That's a little iffy, especially if your control is near non-existent, right? So it's a gray area and it is, it is constantly pushed upon. Uh, there's nothing wrong with exploiting that gray area. You just have to kind of, you know, be careful and know when you're pushing a little bit too hard, too fast or, or whatnot. Okay. You have something you wanted to add? No. I was just gonna say, that doesn't mean you won't find a syndication being advertised, right. okay? okay. <laughs> but now you know the right questions to ask to protect yourself and who to call. Absolutely, so that was, from a legal standpoint, that was more or less what I wanted to know, how to protect myself in identifying a syndicate, other syndicates, right, under a syndication, so. I would like to add that there are proper definitions for syndication, there is not a proper definition for a fund. The reason why that matters is because sometimes you'll see someone advertising a syndication, but it's not really a syndication, it's a fund. Okay. So you also wanna be aware of that. Okay, all right. Um, so when you started, um, I know you said it's kind of like a one-stop shop uh, with the tax attorney, the real estate investors, yourself. Can you go a little bit more into how that's structured um, in terms of, say, like you, you you bring an added value, you're an attorney, you know this stuff inside and out, but how does that work? Is it a fee for structure? Is it you're a part of a syndication? Like, I don't understand how, how you fit and how the puzzle pieces fit together. So this event is for um, my, my law firm. Uh, if you were to hire my law firm, all of our tools are at your disposal. We would take a retainer and we'd go to bat for you. If you're asking about us being involved in your project, well, as a law firm, we, we wouldn't. Now, if you're talking about me as an individual outside of the law firm, along with the we, uh, disclosure, we do real estate stuff outside of my firm, right? If we were doing something or you wanted to do something with us, you know, or, or hire us in some capacity, that's just a, a conversation to be had, but that's that was the purpose of this event, you know. <laughs> that that is correct. All right, uh, my question is: so for the past two years, I've been trying to do because you mentioned the HUD home and the Section Eight and things like that, and I've been trying to get into that mechanism, but I can't because I keep getting priced out. Someone told me that I should consider building. So essentially, it's for almost all three of you, and I'm going to break it down like this. The gentleman over here, um, someone at the 250 under mark who's looking for land to buy and build, would you recommend this gentleman? Can you hear me, guys? All right. For this gentleman here, um, once again, I would buy the land outright cash. What mechanisms would you recommend for me to build at that point? And then for you, sir, 
uh, what mechanisms should I use besides my LLC to protect myself and also protect myself from contractors? Uh, say if they're you know shady or anything like that, what could I use to make sure that the business goes good? You said the mechanisms that you should use to build. You said legal structure. That so that the legal structure is for him. I was, what because you're you're a broker, correct? Right. So what could I? Once I own the land, what products are out there for somebody like me to start building? Financing, you're saying, basically. Got All right, I would ask first um, what the purpose of that development piece that you're trying to do. Are you going to resell, live? I would, it'd probably be a multifamily project where I would build several units on one property and I would, the, I'm, going to section eight all the units. Even though it's new, I'm going to try to build at a uh, square footage price point that makes sense so that I bring people in and I would section eight the f four to six units. You could, you could still find some pockets in the fifth ward, third ward, where you'll find a, a 4,000, 6,000 plot of land for under 50,000. There's still some niche uh, pockets around there um, for that concept that you're, you're proposing. Um, if you're developing the custom home side, then you go outside of the, of the Houston, I guess, scope of Bell Aid um, for acreage line kind of thing. But for that specific plan, there's still some niche uh, without dishing out hundreds of thousands, 50s, 60s for a good four to 6,000 square foot plot of land where you can definitely accomplish that. I would actually wager a guess that for finding the land, Jason might be a better resource, but when you want to be able to build it at a price point that makes sense, seeing as you're doing section eight, that would be more of an Elijah question. I'll take my question real quick, how you would want to structure it. In my opinion, um, uh, section eight isn't, it, I think it gets a little bit of a bad rap more than it should. However, you still want to protect yourself. So I would say that if you have some sort of an entity, uh, a holding entity, and then each property that you have would be under a different LLC, right? Um, think about it. If something goes left, uh, you don't want them to be able to get to the rest of your assets. And you just want them to get to that one asset, which you, of course, every time you get your rent, you drain it, right? So that way, the only entity that they can go after is the one that they're renting from, and it has no assets under other than that property itself. Um, that's, that's what comes to mind, because then you get the Section 8 designation at the holding company level, or you go through the paperwork at that level, but then it's, you have your, your other under companies. Um, that's, that's what immediately comes to mind for how I would structure it. Uh, and you, uh, new developer, starting, okay. Okay, okay. So I'm going to try to answer the location or pricing, I guess, piece, and then the financing piece. So I'm going to give, like, a few resources and, like, names real quick. Um, number one in terms of like, you talked about being priced out. Yeah, that, that's happening. But in terms of trying to find those markets right now, y'all go Google City of Houston Complete Communities. There's 10 communities here in, in the City of Houston that Mayor Turner has identified as underserved. And because of that, the city is doing all they can to push private, public, and philanthropic dollars into those communities. So what does that mean for you? You should be following the money, right? They're building infrastructure, schools, parks, you build homes, right? Um, and you'll catch that appreciation uh, wave. Um, the Complete Communities website is pretty cool because as you go to each particular uh, community, they break down and tell you everything right? The demographics, the investments they're making, so on and so forth. So you can kind of align yourself with that. So that's, that's one. 
Um, as far as the pricing out, once you figure out one's community, um, you you got to get out there and find some of these property owners uh, to get a good a better deal. I'm not saying there's not stuff that's on the market that won't work, but of course, direct to the property owner is going to be a lot less. So I think that kind of touch pricing out area, you know, that kind of stuff. In terms of financing, you're talking about hood. So essentially, that's that's an affordable housing development in the, at the end of the day, um, whether you do single family, duplex, 20 unit, whatever the case is. So there are some specific uh, banks and lenders for that. Right. So you have a uh, LISC Houston. They're affordable housing. Um, I think they do pre-development as well as long term financing. LISC, LISC, Houston. Um, who else we talked to today? Cadence Bank. They have a good affordable housing uh, program uh, that they do. Um, Capital Impact Partners. They do pre-development and short-term bridge financing. Enterprise Community Partners. And the last one I'll probably give is probably like Amogee. Amogee is Amogee Bank. Amogee is pretty flexible with, they do a lot of these like tax credit deals and affordable housing deals and things like that. So I think like talking to them, at least it gets you on the right path in terms of fi right financing. And then there's like organizations like, like Enterprise, for instance, I think they only require you to have like one build under your belt or something like that. And if you don't, just... No, find a partner. <laughs> okay. Cool. I think we got one question in the back right here. The big bad customer. What is the number one indicator when you know that you need? Because I heard you. I came late. I apologize. What's that number one indicator when it's time to do like that asset protection? When you was talking about structuring your company in Delaware and everything else, when do you know that hey, it's time for me to take my company to that level based on scaling? Well, there's different levels to asset protection, right? Um, I was just having a conversation with a, a client, um, a new client. He wanted a bunch of fancy stuff. He wanted a revocable trust. He wanted a, uh, a revocable trust. And he wanted um, a bunch of structures underneath it. I said, well, you know what? An irrevocable trust doesn't make sense unless you've got a net worth of at least 10 million. I would say over 15 million. Um, he said, oh, yeah, well, one of my companies uh, is, is worth about 25 million. I was like, oh, well, I'm sorry, sir. All right. Um, so again, there's layers to it. You brought up Delaware, I'll use that as an example. You can have perfectly good asset protection with just a bunch of Texas entities. You wanna use Delaware in certain scenarios. Um, uh, let me ask you a question. Do you operate nationwide or just here in Texas? Just Texas. Then I see no need for you to do anything outside of Texas. That's the first thing. Um, and I'm guessing you're a general contractor. Okay. so. Uh, another client, they were a general contractor that operated in about nine different states. The way that they were structured is that they had a holding company um, and that holding company had about six different LLCs and those LLCs operated in different regions. So one LLC per state and then a couple of those LLCs had more than one state. Right, and the reason why they did that is because if something happened in Texas, then um, you know they couldn't get to the assets of the LLC or anything else in another state. Right? Um, for for you, I would imagine that if you have uh, if you have a structure already, you're basically you have basic limited liability. Uh, there is a Something that you could do is create a construction management company and have uh, your clients contract with the construction management company. And then the construction management company is the one that hires the GC. 
And as you make money, they're paying the construction management company. The construction management company pays the GC. If they, if something goes wrong, then they have privity of contract with the construction management company, not the GC, which means that they can't come after the GC. Now, is there a way that they could possibly come after the GC? Yes, but they'll have a much higher hurdle to be able to go after the GC because they didn't contract with the GC. You know who they contracted with? The construction management company. And you know what assets that construction management company has? Goose egg, right? So, and again, I'm kind of spitballing off the top of my head. These things are like a puzzle. We have to figure out what's uh, specific to your situation. Um, I have a whole different one that I've, I've made for people who are landlords. Um, but yeah, does that answer your question? Okay. Edison, Jason, Elijah, I just want to say thank you for the talk. It's been very informative. This is a sort of broad overview uh, real estate investment question. But for somebody who's just getting it into real estate and wanting to add that to their portfolio, but they, they want the growth, they want the upside of the real estate sector, but they want a more passive role and they don't want to be heavily involved and they're just getting into it. Would you recommend publicly listed REITs or sort of what's, what's a good gateway into real estate investments for somebody who's just getting into it and has a long, long, long time you know, horizon? and isn't really looking for an active role, say in a syndicate or whatever it might be, but just wants a, a passive role that has decent growth and not necessarily a, a large upfront capital requirement? Um, so I'll say, I'll give you my answer, but yeah, you can go with um, uh, uh, various uh, exchange traded items, uh, REITs and whatnot. Um, you just want to make sure that you pay attention to the fees uh, that they, they load fees, whatever that means. And um, uh, once you do your research, you'll see that there's all sorts of little fees that one might charge that another might not. Uh, I would say first pay attention to that. You find a good one that's been around for a little while and that pays the dividend out consistently as they're supposed to. That's not a bad place to start. Um, I would say that if you were to, again, like I was telling the other lady earlier, if you're in this type of a, an atmosphere, a group, and you keep your ear to the ground, you might be able to find some investment opportunities that are lower dollar. You know, you might be able to find something that, you know, maybe uh, there's uh, construction firms who need a, um, you know, like mobilization funds. Maybe they just need a, a small 10 or $15,000 and they need it for, X number of months, three months or something like that, you might be able to find uh, small investment deals that are willing to take 25 or 20 or something like that. Um, those are harder to find, the smaller dollar amount deals, but you know, you keep your ear to the ground, those can be very lucrative. Yeah, uh -huh. I think, yeah, just, yeah, if you're not looking at that six hands dirty, um, yeah, REIT's probably gonna be the way to go because they're more public. Um, yeah, definitely some different syndications or funds. But then, I mean, we talked about platforms and stuff earlier, but I mean, there are platforms like um, like FunNet Flip, for instance. Um, they have specific projects and you can go look at the returns and just put your money in that and get a passive return back. Right. Um, but that's pretty limited. Um, outside of that, yeah, you're going to have to get in the room and kind of work the room and find, find uh, opportunities. Um, <laughs> with the scenario that you gave me, I would definitely partner up with somebody that shares a, a similar um, approach that doesn't want to get, I guess, dive in, but that together you can kind of get a bit of a, maybe a stronger capital and start with flipping. Perhaps that's kind of a very uh, outside spectrum of, of the real estate game. Uh, they bring the money. Yeah. They, bring, they do the work. Right. Um, and again, find a good GC that you establish a good relationship with, um, establish the fees, and you, you just kind of step back. Hey, here's here's the money. There's the return I need. But definitely do find some partners that you can kind of 
raise a bit more capital um, and start with a small project. I don't know, find a, a small duplex that's that's tired and just needs a small rehab. And and I, I think that in, in, in your scope of, of capital that you could kind of get readily available by yourself or three or four, you know, peers. All right, so we're winding down. We have one more question in the front, but do we have any more questions in the back? Real quick, so we can kind of all right, look like you're the last question of the night. Um, I want to see if I could possibly refer um, this person to you. He's a young investor, um, wanted to use real estate as his avenue to riches, as we all do. Um, he needed some extra money to close on a deal of mine, so he used some liquid cash that he had and invested in. This is new to me, so it sounds like maybe a syndication, somebody he went to school with, um, gave him $30,000 to invest in some flips and some projects. The person was supposed to return $39,000 to him in 90 days. The person he gave the money to invested, um, closed a bunch of deals in these 90 days, never paid him his money. On day 91, well, day 90, because I need you know, to do what I need to do. So you need to get your money from this guy. He paid him back finally his 30000 investment, but never gave him the interest that he was supposed to earn. Is this a contract that you could um, help him enforce? Because he never got what he was essentially promised. <laughs> the short answer is yes. Um, but... <laughs> uh, what they said you, you, you always got to gauge right like um, uh, the amount that it hurts versus the amount that it's going to hurt to hire a an attorney of course it's a no brainer I've lost half a million dollars I'm going to hire an attorney even if I spend a hundred thousand fighting this jackass I, I can come out on top but nine thousand dollars, I mean, that that that's rough. He might have to take the L on that. Um, it's an expensive lesson to learn because if he had the appropriate security, he could just say, I didn't get my nine thousand. I'm gonna foreclose on this project. Uh, yep, I'm taking my arm and my leg. And by the way, you're also gonna pay me for my attorney's fees, this, that, and the next. The same thing that Wells Fargo would have charged if you made them foreclose, you would have that same stuff in your paperwork. So now for one of $9,000, he's stuck like Chuck. He shouldn't have even been able to close on any of those properties because he would have had a lien on it, right? Security. All right, everybody. Well, that concludes us for tonight. Uh, of course, I hope everybody had you know, a great time. Learned a lot of information, a lot of information. Give, give it up to our panelists for coming out tonight. Thank you, everybody. Uh, again, we do these every month, same spot. Uh, the next one will be on October 24th, right here at Wolfgang Puck. Uh, so again, it will be a topic that is centered around for us, uh, real estate. So again, as you go in this next 30 day cycle and have some different things that pop up or questions that you may want to ask, great place to come back. So as we wrap up at the you know, after we finish up here, well, I, of I do have one quick question for the oh. crowd. Oh, there you go. Um, please let me know what types of topics or questions, things that y'all would want to hear about. Right. Because I have things that I think y'all would want to hear about. But y'all can tell me, hey, I'd like to hear more about this. Maybe you want to drill down into certain of these topics or maybe it's something else completely different. Probate. Okay. Perfect. So if All you right. do have a topic, go to our website and you can submit an inquiry of what you want us to talk about on the next one at October 24th, right here at Wolfgang Puck. So thank you, everybody. We have a couple more drinks up here left and a couple, some cold water if you want some. And thank you again for coming out. Have a great night. Bye-bye.